Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found, was blind, but now I see. I lived in New York where I pursued a singing career and worked a day job. I survived September 11th. In the days after September 11th, under pristine blue skies with a pall of acrid smoke hanging over the city, we all walked around stunned, looking at each other to understand how could this happen? How could this happen in our city? Who could do something like this? And my singer's heart, full of all of this, I felt overwhelmed. I felt despair washing over me. Amazing grace allowed me to see clearly. On the one hand, men who use their life's energy for planning and carrying out this exercise of hate and destruction. And on the other side, love rushed in as New Yorkers and people from all over the country sent letters and volunteered and cooked meals and gave free massages and wrote poems and songs and got together to say love will overcome hate. And I asked myself, what would happen if more people used their life's energy for helping each other? And so I said, let it begin with me. And so I started to, so I, lived, I decided to live my life to help others and to love. And I want to share this story with you because it's a decision that transformed my life and has transformed the lives of thousands of other people. So I didn't really know where to start. So I worked and I walked, I sang, I prayed, and I volunteered. One organization that I volunteered with was called the River Fund. They had a program feeding the homeless people living under the boardwalk in Coney Island, Brooklyn. My first job was handing out plastic bags to people in the food line, and I thought, I guess it's not going to stretch my intelligence too much, but let me give it a go. And so I realized it was my chance to welcome people. Good morning. Welcome. Nice to see you. Nice nail polish. And I realized that it wasn't just people, living homeless people from under the boardwalk who were coming. It was people from the neighborhood. People who just wanted to feel that love and that kindness that was emanating from the River Fund workers and volunteers. That, I wanted more of that. In 2003, I went to Kenya to visit a friend, my first time in Africa. We went to a place called Baringo where we had three young men who were our guides, very bright, knew so much about the island, flora and fauna, and they told us their stories. They had told us how they had had to drop out of high school because their parents didn't have money to pay school fees. And I thought, wow. So when I got back to New York, I decided to try to help somebody go to school. And I found an organization that was sponsoring girls for their education in Kenya. And so I started sponsoring a girl named Soila. I volunteered as an or for that organization, and in 2006, I took a leave of absence from my job. I put my singing career on hold temporarily, I thought, 
and moved to Kenya and started teaching school and supporting the sponsorship program. And I was able to spend some time with the girls in their villages. And it was there that I saw the devastation caused by drought. Water points drying up. Pastures completely withered. Livestock dying. Families seeing their family income through livestock just collapsing. Parents panicking. How are we going to send our children to school? I also saw that one of the reasons that young girls don't go to, go, go to school is because their mothers are carrying water the whole day, going long distances, going long distance every day to help their families. And they need their young girls at home to help them with the other chores like carrying firewood home, taking care of the young children. And so um, after, in, during the drought time, we were, were able to do some food relief and we asked them, after the food relief was over, what can help you in a long and sustained way? And they said, clean water. So I told this story to my family. And I, I and a like-minded person called Joseph LaRasha, we decided to put our energy to trying to solve this problem. Did we have any experience doing clean water projects? Oh, no. Did we think it was worth a try? Definitely. And so we started to try to learn from other people how they were doing it. So we just, we, 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 we toured around, we asked a lot of questions, and we learned. And I also found that my skills as a singer also came into play, producing events, getting together groups of people to, to give concerts. So we were able to raise money through concerts and by giving talks and many generous people supported our first well in a place called Imisigio. So we learned many things, and there were many obstacles. But when, life, when water comes to a community, life is transformed. And clean water causes diseases caused by water to go down, like diarrhea and cholera and typhoid. The health of animals and people improve. Girls get to go back to school, and women, they get their time and their energy back. I often think of women who live in communities where there is no clean water as blossoms tightly closed. And I think you can think of so many of the women in your life, how powerful they are, how diverse they are, how talented. When water comes to communities, the blossoms open. We see the talent and the diversity of these amazing women. And I want to talk to you about one such blossom, and her name is Dorcas. Dorcas sat on my couch one day and told me her story. When she was 13, she was married off. Her older sister was supposed to marry, get to get married, but she ran away. The dowry had been paid. Her dad had the cows, and so a girl had to go. And that girl was Dorcas. And so at age 13, she moved far from home, all the way across to the Kilimanjaro Highlands, and she started her new life as a wife and soon a mother. And one of her jobs every day was to carry water for the family. And the closest water point was in a place called, was, was over the border in Tanzania. Three hours walking, waiting in line in a place where they weren't welcome, and then four hours walking back. That's seven eight hours every day. So when Water is Life Kenya, our organization that we formed to do this work, um, brought water, clean water to her community in 2008, her life changed. Six bonus hours every day, from seven hours down to three quarters of an hour every day. And so, Dorcas's dreams were able to be reborn. She had a primary school education. She was able to get a job as a preschool teacher. And pretty soon, she realized that she needed more education. She went home and she asked her husband, Mutero, can I go back to school? And Mutero said, yes. 
Although illiterate himself, he saw the value of further education for his wife and for his family. And the day that Dorcas was sitting on my couch, she had just taken her GED exam. She was giddy, she was exhausted, and she was proud of herself and already looking forward. She said, Joyce, can you help me go to college? I need to learn more about early childhood development. And I said, yes. I said, we don't know where we'll get the money, but you are an inspiration to all of us. And the reason why we do this work 10 years later, if you think of Dorcas and all the Dorcases in all those communities where 50,000 people now have water because of the work that we're doing, and it's Dorcas and Dorcas and all the other blossoms. So Dorcas is inspiring her neighbors and lead, she's now a leader in her community. Water also transforms men. They learn how to manage their water committees. They learn how to solve problems. They learn how to fix the, the borehole equipment. They learn how to problem solve. And they've also become leaders of other organizations in their communities like churches like their children's schools, and they manage important resources like grass for animals. And it's not just the communities that we're helping in Kenya, but it's this community of people who have been inspired because they know that the resources that they've worked hard for can reach people on the ground directly. It's not a matter of reading things in, in the newspaper and saying, ah, oh, there's nothing we can do. There is. We can help solve problems, and the people on the ground who live in the remote corners of Kenya and other parts of the world, too, who think, nobody hears our prayers. Nobody hears us, but they're being heard. And then when the water comes and changes their life, then they can also reach out to other people and help them. And so one of my favorite things to do when I come back to the US is to talk at schools. And I recently got an email from a group of girls who had heard me speak a few months ago, and they are starting their capstone project to deal with water security issues and also to talk about water at their own school. They'll be having a water walk so people can have the experience of carrying water so that they can get the visceral experience of what it's like and really appreciate what we have here in this country, which is so rich. And I just think of those young women and where they'll be, maybe even this year, maybe next year, they'll have a vision and know that they can use their life's energy to help other people, that there's no problem that we can't solve if we work together, especially one person's energy, meeting another person's energy, and the meeting and changing the whole world, and we can do that. And I don't wanna lie to you and pretend that this work is easy. It's not. It takes constant rededication. Engaging people in their own transformation, and I know you know what I'm talking about because there's so many changed, ancient people in this room. It's, a, it's, it's unpredictable and exciting. And we're the wild card. People are amazing and loving and creative. We're also stubborn. We bring chaos. We're corrupt. It happens. So I'm asking you, what kind of a wide, wild card are you going to be? Can you join me in using your life's energy to change our world for the better? I look forward to the day when your loving action creates ripples that meets mine. And together, we can transform the world. Thank you.